it's our pleasure this morning to have the privilege, it's my pleasure to have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Christine Pohl, who was our lecturer yesterday here for one of our Henry Center Scripture and Ministry Lectures. Dr. Pohl, since 1989, has taught at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. She is the professor of Church and Society, and I'm going to ask you about that title in a few minutes. I found that intriguing. Her specialties for her research include Christian social ethics, urban ministry, and Christian hospitality, which will involve most of our discussion this morning. Her lecture yesterday, which is also posted at the Henry Center website, was titled Practicing Hospitality in Troubled Times, Promise and Peril for the Church. And her books include uh, newly published Friendship at the Margins by InterVarsity Press, a forthcoming book, Making Room, or, or rather Practices That Make and Break Community, forthcoming from Erdman's, and then Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as Christian tra Tradition, which was the uh, focus of her lecture yesterday. So, Dr. Paul, I'll begin with that title, that you carry at Asbury Seminary. I was intrigued by that, that you bear the title Professor of Church and Society. Can you explain that, unpack that a little bit for our, our viewing audience, if you would, please? The title predates my coming to Asbury, so oh. I can't ex explain it entirely. Um, that's, that's how they set up their social ethics department. I think it was an effort to situate Christian ethics more contextually to pay more attention to the church's context, so to um, be more um, attentive to the way that the church is in the world. But the prime, we've now actually added the Christian ethics piece, so it's church and society and Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was an effort to say that the um, the church has this key that there, that it's a um, an important subject for reflection to think about how the church should be present in the world and that they would actually have a department that looks at that. So it's Christian ethics, but it's, it's applied. Um, it's, um, it's theological ethics, but it also ha has a component of sociology um, and, you know, attentive to social relations and so on. Very good. Thank you. Yesterday in your lecture, you spoke about hospitality it was it was immensely helpful, by the way, and, and thank you. But you spoke about hospitality in terms that were, I think, generally broader than maybe some of us are used to thinking about hospitality. And thus, I wonder whether you might offer something of a definition or a description, if you will, of what you mean by the term hospitality when you use it. Sure. Um, I think it's offering someone a space into which they wouldn't be welcome un unless someone gave the invitation. So it's a space that somehow you have access to and, and inviting them in. So it can, I mean, that's a very broad definition in the sense. It also sounds probably more personal than it necessarily is, but it, it assumes a certain context that has in some ways some boundaries. Um, that you have strangers um, that would benefit from from entering, so it's the it's the process of of bringing strangers in, um, and that can be at the level of the home, and you know making a place for them in the home, or it can be at the level of the church, or as I was talking about yesterday, it could even be in the civic sphere, where a community recognizes the needs of refugees or immigrants and welcomes them in, so that the or to protect them, so that's where the notion of hospitality and sanctuary or asylum meet um, from from very early days. That's very helpful, thank you. One of the associate pastors at our church attended uh, with me yesterday and he also found the lecture helpful and he, he wondered in the car with me on the way back to our church building, he wondered whether there were experiences in your life that had um, prompted you to this study of hospitality. Definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, it, it, 
ultimately was an academic study for me. It's what I did my, dissert, my PhD dissertation oh, on. Okay. But it came out of years of experience in the church. Before I ever went to seminary and graduate PhD work, I had been ministering in church and social ministry kinds of contexts. And so really starting out pretty early in my life, I had ministered with um, people with disabilities. I did quite a lot of work with refugees, um, worked with sort of students and seekers, people who were sort of lost. and. Um, didn't have the language for hospitality at that point, didn't sort of recognize that there was a coherence across these, these groups. Um, but it had been an important part of my experience and um, realized that in ministering with them, you know, one could talk about it as ministry, but also I was being blessed. And so that was sort of in the back of my mind, trying to think about what that, what that meant, that this was, this was good for both of us or everyone who was involved. And then, my grandmother was incredibly hospitable, so I had a model in her of hospitality um, where she really took anybody in and seemed to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I had that. Um, I, I think I'd also had some experiences myself of having been a stranger, and I think that that makes you very sensitive to people who need welcome, where you've been on the, on the needy end of that. And then when I was in seminary, I encountered the most extraordinary book by Philip Haley. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. No, um, the story no. of Le Chambon and how goodness happened there. And it's actually the story of a French Huguenot community that rescued Jews during World War II. Right, so anyway, okay. I think Haas Guinness familiar. refers to it. Right, right. Um, am, yeah. You know, I, I discovered it. It seemed like by chance, but I think it was by God's providence. Um, and he tells that story, I mean, he, he was actually a Jewish ethicist who had studied the Holocaust, but he tells the story of this little village and he uses the language of hospitality. And actually that's one of the first times I ever saw hospitality referred to with real moral substance. Um, you know, it was risky, it was extremely important, it made a difference in thousands of people's lives. And so I sort of tucked that away. And then when I was in, at Emory, um, we talked a lot in the, in the ethics program there. It was an ethics and society program, and there was quite a lot of attention at that time to questions of inclusion and difference, voice recognition, who was part of the group, who was, you know, how you made people welcome, the issues of power and influence. And it was striking to me at that time that the discussions were often framed either by political theory or social theory or something like that, but not very often where they really rooted theologically and not, not biblically. And I kept thinking, you know, surely the church has had to deal with these issues of difference and particularity and unity before. There must have been a way that the church talked about it. And I started to have a hunch based on some of the biblical passages in Corinthians and Acts, um, and Galatians, um, that, uh, that the struggle over welcome and difference and what you were going to do with Jews and Gentiles and how you're going to um, have rich and poor be one in the community, that the church might have dealt with that in the language of hospitality. So that was really, this was, gosh, when did I start working with that? Sort of around 88, so quite some time ago and before there was the rather much larger conversation about hospitality today. But I kind of followed the, my dissertation committee was wonderful and they let me follow the hunch to see if really hospitality had been a significant moral category for the church, and it had. So I kind of traced it from the biblical times up through the 18th century um, as this sort of massive project. And I would commend any of the viewers of this uh, interview also to see the lecture where you set forth in general terms. At very least. quickly. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. That case. But another thing that you did yesterday that was that was really helpful was um, and I suppose I should have made this tie in my own mind before, but was to tie the Christian practice of hospitality back to the character of God, that he shows himself to be oh, yeah. a host in scripture. Even in the 23rd Psalm, thou anointest my head with oil, my right. cup runneth over. He's the great banquet host. That's right. Uh, as That's as right. seen in that particular Psalm. So I found that very helpful. I wonder, as a follow-up question, if you might offer to the uh, the viewing 
audience for this uh, question and answer session. A couple of examples that have really touched you in your own life personally of perhaps a time when you were offered hospitality. You mentioned that. And it really was a, an extraordinary blessing to you and maybe an occasion on which you offered hospitality. And it was an incredible blessing both to you but to that other person as well. Sure. I think one of the um, first... Well, I, I, I sort of told about my grandmother who right. sort of always made room and that was, that was important. When, after I graduated from college, uh, I spent some time at Labrie Fellowship oh, you did? in oh, England. Okay. And that was a very formative time, probably the first time I had really experienced the significance of the con combination of conversation and shared meals. That really, that's how they did discipleship. It was around the table, eating together. I mean, they opened their homes. They welcomed large numbers of students and seekers into the community. And then really hours each day were spent in conversation and eating together. That, I mean, the number of people in those days that came to Christ through that experience or who were deepened in their faith mm. uh, was extraordinary. And it was really a very simple, although demanding, expression of hospitality on the part of the families that did it. And I think that stayed with me. It influenced how I went back and did the, the, the next series of work that I did um, in, in very significant, very important ways. Um, so that experience of shared meals, talking about substantive things, being hospitable to different views also, um, that, and, and welcoming people, each person sort of with the, with the gifts that they bring. Mm -hmm. So that was probably one of the first really key ones. Um, I think an, um, one early also, sort of subsequent to Labrie, was that I owned a Christian bookstore for six years and in a community that was largely Jewish. And so there weren't very many safe spaces where people could interact, hear the, hear the gospel in a, in a place that seemed relatively neutral. And so the experience of trying to offer a place of hospitality that was safe for conversation where people could really ask important questions and so on was something that I realized was very life-giving. And then in my work with refugees was probably one of the key times my church resettled a lot of refugees, um, hundreds of them actually. And um, in that time, I, that's where I discovered that the mutuality of the welcome, it really, our welcome to them made the difference between life and death for them, basically, in terms of resettlement and getting out of camps and those kinds of things. And especially when we were willing also to resettle some of the families. But then when they came, their testimony to us, to the congregation, was also life-changing. Um, many of them, uh, especially the Cambodian refugees, had become Christians in the camps. And their stories of the way that God had worked in their lives, their testimonies of faithfulness, really changed our little congregation. And I think that was one of the places where I really saw the mutuality of hospitality and how God was so utterly present, both in the role of the guest and the host. So these were refugees from the killing fields. Yes, they were. They were. I mean, first it was Vietnamese refugees, then Cambodian, then later Ethiopian, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and several other places, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, so those were early experiences of um, personal experiences. Then when I was doing the book, I stayed in a number of communities of hospitality where I was welcomed, but also sometimes one of the most interesting things was that the communities would welcome, initially welcome me in to study and to sort of learn from them. But later, after I'd studied all these communities, I got to go back in some cases and teach those communities what I had learned from the community, uh, the communities that I had spent time with. So it was a, again, it was this wonderfully mutual mm -hmm. experience. In your, um, in your research for your book, did you study, in addition to Protestant, some of the Catholic communities, um, the, the convents or monasteries that do welcome outsiders for periods of refreshment and... Definitely. Uh -huh. Definitely. Uh, the Benedictine communities probably have the longest unbroken tradition of, of hospitality and because of the rule of Benedict in chapter 53 and the emphasis on the welcome to guests. Um, I actually did one of my sabbaticals at St. John's um, University in Abbey 
<clears throat> in, in Minnesota. So I, I really was kind of immersed in this Benedictine community as I was writing on, um, on hospitality and learned a great deal from the monks and nuns, a great deal about community as well as hospitality. Yeah. Do you see in the, in the New Testament in particular a spiritual gift for hospitality as well as the, the ordinary, the command to all believers to practice hospitality? When we understand that's a, a universal command, um, but do you see a, a spiritual gift for some people, maybe like your grandmother, for example? I think there are people who are spiritually gifted for it. Um, they make it look easy. They, they love it. They thrive doing it. So I think there is um, a spiritual gift. But I think that um, it's, it's even more than a command, although I think it's, a, it's an expectation of the people of God that we will practice hospitality. So I, I, I don't, I, I'm always wary when people sort of locate it as a spiritual gift, and so only a few people have it and I don't have right. to do it. Um, so I, I, I think it is a command, but it's much more a way of life. I mean, I think it's integral to discipleship. And um, so that we're really missing something when we're not practicing it. It's, we're missing the chance to be most fully reflective of who God is and um, fully responsive to what God has done in welcoming us. So yes, a gift, but much more so a way of life as well as a command. Mm -hmm. now, now, in the lecture yesterday, and, and this is the one point at which I'll sort of backtrack a bit, you did speak, uh, and of course the title of the lecture, The Promise and Then the Perils mm -hmm. of Hospitality. I wonder if you could recapitulate just briefly uh, for the audience some of the promise of hospitality, and then I think um, the, the perils were certainly very thoughtful, and, and perhaps uh, many of us hadn't thought of those. Sure. Um, I think the, the promise is um, related to, more than anything, to the experience of, of engaging with God in, in the work of God in the world. God, God has welcomed us. We get to welcome, to make a place for strangers. In our culture, there's such a hunger for belonging and for welcome that hospitality really addresses that sort of deep human need, I think. And so that's part of the promise, is that as we do that, we both respond to person's needs, but we also get to kind of represent the gospel, the good news, so that we embody what we're talking about. That's a really challenging thing. That's a transforming opportunity. Um, it's all of the work of Christ in making a place for us, then we get to um, re-experience, re-express. Um, I think in terms of, um, I was talking about the social service models that the church has pretty much adopted where there's a very big distinction between provider and recipient. I don't think that's a helpful model for the church. And hospitality again reminds us of the mutuality the reciprocal blessing that's there as we open our lives to people. Yeah, that engagement. If uh, um, again, the, many of the viewers of the interview will be pastors. I wonder if you would connect because many of our churches are seeking to grow. We, we've recognized, especially in a suburban area like this one, for mm -hmm. example that people who live here are generally from someplace else. Mm -hmm. They don't have family close by. Mm -hmm. And the church needs to act more and more as family, and that includes a mm -hmm. role for hospitality. We found that one of the ministries that enables us to practice hospitality is small home groups. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about, because this wasn't in the, nobody asked a question about this yesterday, but I know the pastors who are looking at this are going to wonder, okay, the practice of hospitality, Dr. Paul, make a connection between that and small home groups, if you would, please. I think there's a huge connection there, and I, I was trying to address that yesterday in the lecture where I talked about the most significant location for hospitality being the overlap of household and church. Right. Historically, right. that was the case. I mean, in the early church where it was really vibrant as a practice, it was when the church was still meeting in homes. And so I think probably the most likely place for those kinds of transformations to happen today are where 
sort of smaller groups of congregations, so something like small groups, are meeting in people's homes because that's such a personal, intimate space. But it's not quite the same as just doing hospitality on your own separate from the church. I think one of the things about church hospitality that makes it transformative is that God is ultimately host and everybody's guest. It's a, it's a equalizer in a different kind of, of way. And um, we're all, in a sense, part of God's house and community. So when we gather together in a small group in a home, that reality is still there, but there's also the intimacy of the home. So I think extraordinary things can happen in small groups if people don't let them become trivialized or right. just, just an activity. Now, I think that's a really important thought that you've brought out that I, I, I hadn't considered myself, I have to admit previously, when we gather in a small home group, as a practical matter, being sort of the practical Americans that we are, we have a, a host family, and that's mm -hmm. a role. Mm -hmm. But you're encouraging us to think of God as the host for that group. I mean, the family yeah. is. The and, family and is, and that's important. Way, yeah. And that's important. But to think ultimately as mm -hmm. the Lord, mm -hmm. of the Lord himself mm -hmm. as the host for mm -hmm. that. I think so. I think that can help us get past some of the differences, some of the worries about whether we have everything exactly right, some of the whether tendencies, the is clean. <laughs> some of the tendencies to view hospitality just as entertaining, which is a huge mm -hmm. problem. Um, but to see it much more as expressive of God's God's welcome, mm -hmm. but in personal space. Uh, how did, would you draw a connection between? We use the term in. Um, in ministry and church life, shared life. Draw a connection between the practice of hospitality and the sharing of life, if you would, for me. I, I know there's a, a really close connection, obviously. I think probably the, the closest connection is that we offer hospitality to one another. We welcome one another within community into, into our lives, back and forth all the time. That's how you build community, right? By an ongoing kind of practice of hospitality. In that Romans 13, 14 welcome yeah. sort of way. Yeah, uh -huh. and at the same time, hospitality pushes the community outward to welcome strangers in. And so that's part of what keeps communities vibrant as they're engaging outside, as they're incorporating people. It's also part of what makes the struggle um, of incorporating people that are different, of figuring out what the community's identity is going to be, how it's going to absorb strangers, those kinds of things. But I think it works both ways. It, in, it um, reinforces, that's, that's been the power of hospitality, is that it reinforces uh, relational bonds. But it also, especially because of the teaching of Jesus, it pushes those bonds outward toward people we don't know, and we welcome them into the community. Because Jesus would eat with tax collectors That's and right. sinners. That's right. That's right. I mean, he really and, had quite and, a broad yeah, kind of view of hospitality. the boundaries mm -hmm. of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, one of the things, uh, another aspect of your lecture that was, was really helpful was something you stressed two or three times, which is you don't want to talk about hospitality as another thing the church needs to do, but even as you've already mentioned in this interview, as a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Again, pastors are a, a substantial part of the audience, the viewing audience for these question and answer sessions. So I wonder what you would say to pastors, and, and somebody did ask a question about this yesterday afternoon, but I'll follow up from that. What you would say to pastors about the practice of hospitality both in two ways. Is there anything that's particular to the practice of hospitality by a pastor and his family themselves? And is there anything that you would say to us about shepherding, about leading our churches then in the practice of hospitality? Sure. Um, I guess I would say, first of all, um, you've really got to model it if you're going to teach your people about it so that I think pastors... Hospitality is much more than, you know, something nice that you might do occasionally. I think it has to be a way, a way of life for the pastor. And that can be a challenge if that's not been the way the pastor has operated before. But um, to find ways to welcome people into your own life, into the life of your family, a certain level of transparency. These are, these are tricky, this is tricky ground. Um, but I think it's, it's very important ground that um, pastors 
learn in a sense to share themselves um, wisely um, to create a culture of hospitality within the, within the congregation. That, can be, that doesn't have to always be in the home. It can be within the church building itself. It can be by encouraging small groups. I think um, pastors simultaneously have to take care of their families and so that the issues of Sabbath and boundaries and f sorting that out, and families are different. Some families do much better with a lot of people in and out of their lives than other families do, and some families have particular circumstances that they have to deal with. Um, but I think that one of the important things to remember for pastors that, is that, in a sense, you're representing God to the community. Mm -hmm. And when pastors don't make room, when they don't have time and so on, I think people hear that and see that as also an expression of the church not having room and time and of God not having room and time. So it's an awesome responsibility, I think, for the pastor as the representative, in a sense, of the community to take seriously that they represent a welcoming God. That doesn't mean that we're not going to fail or mess up and that there's not forgiveness. I don't mean that at all. But I think most of the time we don't realize how significant it is and that when we close the door or when we um, just brush it off as not important or I just don't have time for that because I have to get to my tasks that are a little bit more measurable and I can write up for my district superintendent or whatever, right. um, we miss a chance to really um, offer the hope of the welcome that we have in God. In the question and answer session after the lecture yesterday, you said you, you challenged pastors, and I, I think this was a very appropriate and helpful challenge. Do we perhaps in subtle ways communicate to people, I don't have time for you? That's different from, I, I really have to do this right now. I have time for you, but just not right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's different, but do we inadvertently communicate to people on a regular basis I don't have time for you again because I'm task oriented and this will show up on my annual review and so forth that's right I, I think I think we do I mean I think there are a thousand subtle ways that we can um, welcome somebody into our office or whatever and simultaneously tell them that they're really interrupting us that we're busy we're afraid of not being busy because it looks like we're not doing important things or we're something not or other. We're not, you know, not I mean, if busy. we're too available, people would wonder what we were doing with our time. So I think, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a tension. It's hard. You can't be available to everybody. I mean, that's, that's part. And there are people who really need a lot of your time. And as a pastor, as any kind of leader, as a teacher, whatever, you, you can't give infinite amounts of time. But you can give someone undivided attention for a little while. And that's often all, just for a couple of minutes. I mean, the, the willingness to sit down and sort of be eye to eye with somebody just for a few minutes, but to listen to their story, says something about their being valued and not sort of dismissed. It was interesting when I was interviewing the guests in these various uh, communities of hospitality, I would ask them how they knew that they were welcome. And um, oftentimes they said to me, I didn't feel like an interruption. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a huge insight. I didn't feel like an interruption. Mm -hmm. Because how often that's really how we view people when we're, when we're sort of oriented toward getting something done and the opportunity for welcome or attention comes and we sort of brush it away as at an interruption. Or we acknowledge the person, but we also make sure that they know we really don't have very much time for them. It's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one of your areas of emphasis is urban ministry. And, and I, I, I wonder, because um, the, the pastors who will view this are from uh, urban, suburban, rural settings, uh -huh. all three. Uh -huh. And uh, obviously, well, I say obviously, is it obvious, does the practice of hospitality, and let's just confine it to the United States for the purposes of this discussion, uh, does the practice of hospitality differ in those three settings? In probably some of subtle ways, yes. Um, there are issues of scale, there are issues of transportation, um, sort of location kinds of things, but I think the basic practice is the same. The, the hunger for the, the substance same. is the same, okay. I think. Mm 
um, the outworking. I mean, I often think that some of the the issues that people face in urban ministry are not very different from the issues you face in rural ministry that have to do with really quite similar needs. I mean, the issues of transportation and distance are different, but besides that, there's a lot of commonality in terms of ministry. Um, I think in suburbia, um, part of the challenge is the insulation, that you can kind of live your life in a way that doesn't really encounter very many strangers and that kind of protects you from from strangers, which is problematic because it takes more intentionality then to it connect. It does take more, to, yeah. Um, trying to think if there's... Um, but I think in suburbia there's also probably I would think almost the deepest levels of, of loneliness and alienation at the same time because people do live in their very isolated little bubbles and so that the need for for hospitality is very significant often within those communities themselves. That's very helpful, thank you. The final question I wanted to ask to shift gears just a bit has to do with your forthcoming book, Practices That Make and Break Community. And I wonder if you could give us a little bit of a foretaste of some of the practices that make and some of the practices that break community. Yeah, actually it comes out of the work on hospitality. Okay. And when I interviewed some practitioners, they said, hospitality is hard and you can't do it without community. But community is even harder. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> I think we have a problem here. And I started asking myself really and them, why community was so hard, um, why doing community is hard. And there's lots of sort of sociological reasons today why we struggle with community. I mean, we've been raised to be pretty autonomous individual people. We like having lots of choice. Um, we like being able to do things on our own and so on. And then, you know, when you sort of insist that the church community is sort of fundamental to who we are as people of God, we think, well, how are we going to make these communities be more than just sort of this association of individuals? And when I started, I actually did a long-term um, project funded by the Lilly Endowment to look at communities um, of practice. And we discovered pretty quickly the significance of making and keeping promises that if there's not fidelity, you don't really have a community. And so I wanted to look a lot more at promise making and promise keeping and then the deformation, which is betrayal. Mm -hmm. And how that sort of builds sort and of breaks community. Covenant ideas. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's very hard to look at promise keeping and promise making without looking at truthfulness. I mean, the Bible itself links those two. So looking at truth telling and deception in relation to communities and how often that becomes a point of of struggle and difficulty. If you look at when congregations fall apart, what's going on? Well, oftentimes there's betrayal, there's deception and so on. So looking at that in the context of community. And then a little bit later on, I started to realize that communities wither if there's not gratitude. If there's not gratitude to God and there's not gratitude to one another, that where there's grumbling or chronic dissatisfaction and so on. Um, communities just become unbearable. And so those are actually the practices that I'm looking at in this book, along with kind of a revisiting of hospitality, which seems to be a, a good practice to kind of maybe be a lens of, of getting at the other ones. But that's what I'm working on. And I actually worked with a group of pastors and some other academics, but I had um, a chance to bring together, um, I think, 12 pastors from around the country to um, talk and write about their experiences in congregational life of making and keeping promises or betrayal or truth telling and stuff so that there was this very good interaction I think about the actual kind of grounded issues and ways that it plays out. There were some agonizing stories too. There were, there mm -hmm. were. It was, um, they really, uh, you know, some of the, some of the deformations really do break people and communities apart. But where it's beautiful, it's often not noticed unless you name it. I mean, some of the ordinary realities of congregational life, we just take for granted. But when we start thinking about them as an expression of fidelity, all of a sudden we realize how wonderful these very ordinary um, practices are, too. Well, Dr. Pohl, thank you so very much. We're right, grateful for your lecture and pray the Lord's blessings on your ministry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.